Thank you, Sarah, for your um, very kind introduction. And also thank you, Hillary, for organizing this. Um, after four days in Boston, it's nice um, to have an opportunity to speak on these issues. Um, I've been asked to uh, address um, the Kerry plan, whether it's deja vu or something new. And for those of you who have to leave early, um, the short answer is it's something new. Um, in, in recent years, as um, Israel has continued its creeping annexation of, um, of Palestinian territory, particularly in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the debate about whether or not the two-state settlement has um, lost its relevance, and with that, the debate about whether Palestinians should seek to achieve a um, uh, one or two state outcome in their struggle for self determination has increasingly come center stage. Um, my own view on the situation is seen from a Palestinian perspective. Uh, the debate is rather premature. It's, as, I've, as I often characterize it, it's a bit like a condemned man on the night before his execution, um, being unable to sleep because he's agonizing over whether to spend his um, next summer vacation in the French or the Italian Riviera, um, for the simple reason that I feel Palestinians do not really have um, uh, the mechanisms in place to, to seriously uh, discuss and to promote any alternative um, for their struggle at this point. Nevertheless, um, I would like to offer a few, um, a few thoughts on, on where I think uh, things, things are heading, and particularly with respect to the Kerry Plan. Now, in terms of background, it's, it's often suggested that the reason um, uh, the two-state settlement is no longer relevant is because Oslo has failed, and Oslo failed to produce a um, a two-state uh, a two-state outcome. My own view is that Oslo hasn't failed; that Oslo should be viewed as perhaps one of the most successful um, uh, diplomatic agreements of of the post-war um, uh, era. It's still alive and well, and rather than seeing uh, the Kerry plan as as one more attempt to hold meaningless talks um, or process for the sake of preventing a vacuum, um, we would do well to see it as very much the logical culmination of 20 years of Oslo and trying to bring this to a successful conclusion. And by successful conclusion, I don't mean um, a two-state settlement as, as most people would interpret it. Uh, but rather um, uh, the establishment of the Palestinian entity within the restrictions of, um, of the Oslo process, which is another way of saying um, that when we have this debate over one versus two states, uh, we need to bear in mind that um, a two-state settlement has never really been seriously attempted, um, least of all in the context in the context of, um, of Oslo. Now, if we, if we look back at the Oslo Agreement, which is really only three or four pages long, so for those of you who haven't yet done so, I would strongly encourage you to read it. And also when we look at, at the broader context in which it emer emerged, um, I think it becomes quite clear that Oslo was never about ending the Israeli occupation um, uh, of of the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, and replacing that with a um, uh, uh, Palestinian uh, state along the lines of UN Security Council 242 and 338, and a just resolution of the refugee question, and so on. Rather, it was very much about reformulating the Israeli, if, if I'm not speaking loud enough, feel free to interrupt me if my voice drops off again. Um, <coughs> so um, Oslo was very much about reformulating the Israeli-Palestinian relationship 
on account of several factors. Um, first and foremost, the 1987-1993 Palestinian uprising, which demonstrated to the Israeli political and military elite that the status quo had become untenable. And then, in addition, other factors such as the end of the Cold War, um, uh, the repositioning of, of the United States, uh, in, at least in the military sense, directly in the Middle East, and last but not least, uh, structural changes in the Israeli economy, where an economy that was largely dependent on, on, on manufacturing and agriculture and the textile industry and so on, as a result of, uh, primarily as a result of the mass immigration of, of, of uh, Soviet Jews in the late 1980s, became much more of a service-oriented and high-tech economy, which is another way of saying um, uh, the need of the Israeli economy for Palestinian labor decreased markedly. And in the <coughs> broader context of all this, there was a reformulation of Israeli policy towards the Palestinians from one of, if I can call it, enforced integration, which had been the policy since 1967. Of, of seeking to integrate not only territory, but the Palestinian economy, and to a certain extent, the Palestinian population itself, into the Israeli state, to one of separation, um, which, as Ehud Barak so eloquently put it, meant us here and them there. Now, this was quite different than us to the west of, of the 1960 67 boundaries, and them um, to the east of those uh, boundaries. Rather, it was about um, uh, a new territorial disposition, but within the context of continued overall Israeli control of the Palestinian um, people. And this was also, I think, quite clear in the Oslo agreements, where if you read it, you don't see words or terms such as occupation, statehood, sovereignty, independence, self-determination, and really the only terms of reference um, that exist in Oslo is a single reference, if I'm not mistaken, to UN Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, which is rather meaningless when one takes into account the fundamentally contradictory um, interpretations of what those resolutions mean by the Palestinians and the international community on the one hand and Israel on the other. Um, Israeli jurists have in the past um, argued that, in fact, Israel fulfilled its obligations under 242 and 338 in 1982 when the last Israeli soldiers left the Sinai Peninsula because Sinai constitutes some um, 90% of the territories Israel occupied in, um, in 1967. <laughs> in addition to this, there are no mandatory arbitration mechanisms set forth in Oslo um, arbitration is something that's basically uh, at the discretion of Israel in the sense that it requires the agreement of both parties, nor is there any mandatory enforcement um, uh, mechanism should voluntary um, arbitration uh, be pursued. So every, you know, many of the things that were seen as challenges or failures of the Oslo process in the 1990s, such as continued Israeli settlement expansion, increasing Israel's hold over East Jerusalem, and so on. And then in the, in the 2000s, um, uh, the construction of uh, the West Bank Wall and the redeployment slash withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, um, I would argue are actually entirely consistent with Oslo if we see them in the broader framework of, of a um, policy shift from integration um, uh, to uh, uh, separation. <laughs> now, this brings us um, to the current diplomatic developments. Um, briefly, and, and this is, I think, a little speculative on my part because I know very little about the formulation of American foreign policy, but my sense is that when Kerry came into office, he kind of took a look at the globe and at the Middle East and saw that there was very little possibility to achieve anything. Um, Syria was a complete mess. Um, uh, Egypt was not what it seemed to be. 
there seemed little prospect of dealing seriously with the Iranian nuclear file. Um, but the Israeli-Palestinian conflict represented a real opportunity, precisely because of the upheaval in the Arab world, um, the Palestinians were more weakened and isolated than, than at any point in, in contemporary history. And in addition to that, there was um, a very broad-based fragmentation at multiple levels, partly reflecting Oslo, and here I would um, point, for example, to the fragmentation uh, between Palestinians in the occupied territories and Palestinian communities in the diaspora, between the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and partly fragmentation that, that reflected, uh, to put it crudely, problems of the Palestinians' own making. And here I would particularly point to the schism between, um, uh, between Fatah and, uh, and Hamas. So you had a um, Palestinian decision-making circle that had been reduced to a very narrow elite, um, but nevertheless with a capacity to make decisions that would be very difficult um, uh, to challenge from within the Palestinian um, uh, political system. And, um, you know, and, and as, uh, as Kerry began his discussions with Israeli and Palestinian leaders, um, I think he finally hit upon a formula for enticing um, the Palestinian leadership, specifically Mahmoud Abbas, into talks. Uh, and as we saw so often, you know, give the Palestinians a tactical achievement in exchange for strategic concessions. In this case, release um, several dozen prisoners who had already been in um, uh, Israeli jails prior to Oslo. And in exchange for that, um, the Palestinians would agree to participate in negotiations with Israel for a period of six to nine months, and not less importantly, undertake no initiatives during that period with regard to the internationalization of the Palestinian question in terms of um, pursuing Security Council resolutions or seeking expanded Palestinian membership in international institutions <laughs> and so on. Um, and, and as we've seen Kerry operate during the past year, um, uh, former American officials have, have on some occasions described um, the United States as Israel's lawyer. I think it would be fair to say that what we're seeing now is, is, is Kerry basically acting as Israel's bouncer, um, going well beyond the traditional role of, of lawyer. If we see, for example, some of the um, uh, proposals that, that he has widely been reported to have made, um, most prominently the formula that's now apparently being pursued is the 1967 boundaries and land swaps. Now, on the face of it, that might seem encouraging. The 1967 boundaries are going to be um, uh, the basis for any um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement. Nevertheless, um, when you say 1967 plus land swaps, and you neither determine the maximum extent of any such land swaps, um, nor any formula for reciprocity of such land swaps, and perhaps even more importantly, make clear that such land swaps are obligatory and have to be achieved by agreement rather than at Palestinian discretion, you're effectively saying that any territory that Israel would like to retain in the concept, in the context of a peace agreement is disputed territory rather than occupied territory, which Israel um, uh, is under an obligation to relinquish unless an agreement can be reached with the Palestinians um, uh, to, uh, to make adjustments. Similarly, Kerry appears to have um, adopted the most recent Israeli demand, which is for um, Palestinian recognition of Israel as a Jewish state. Um, uh, the vast majority of settlements are expected to, um, uh, to remain uh, within sovereign Israeli territory, and the refugee question, to the best of my understanding, um, uh, such an agreement will not even go through the motions of acknowledging that anything untoward might have happened 
in, in the mid 20th um, uh, century, but it will simply set forth uh, proposals for resettlement and, and um, uh, compensation. Now, um, people have suggested that this is something that Abbas can never accept, um, uh, that this is something that even in, given the increasingly rightward shift in, in the Israeli political spectrum, that it's something the Israelis will reject or be unable to accept, um, uh, and that therefore we should see this as one more round of talks motivated by the growing American fear of the consequences of political vacuum <coughs> should, these, should these talks collapse. I would beg to differ, and I think what we will see in the next few weeks is, is the Americans coming out with a statement, what they've called a framework um, uh, proposal, um, the purpose of which is to um, permit for the continuation of negotiations but not merely for the sake of their continuation, but rather to establish a framework for their successful conclusion in the next nine or 12 or, or 18 months. And I think here there are several things to look for. First and foremost, will the Americans propose an interim uh, agreement or will they go straight for a framework agreement? Now, um, if they go for an interim agreement, that will be a sign that the Americans are increasingly pessimistic and therefore are seeking to make certain minor achievements um, uh, on the ground. My, my educated guess would be that the Americans have, have determined that they should and can achieve a permanent status agreement and therefore um, will not go for any interim arrangements within, within the West Bank between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. And this effectively means that, that the Kerry team has, has looked at the prior history of Middle East diplomacy and has chosen for, if I can call it, the Egyptian model, where you bring the two parties together to agree on the outlines of a permanent um, uh, agreement between them and then negotiate the implementation of those principles as opposed to the Palestinian model where you seek to achieve a, a peace treaty on the basis of a series of interim measures and, and interim agreements. The difference here, of course, is that Netanyahu and Abbas will not, be, will not be bought to Camp David to sign an agreement. What's more likely is that um, uh, Kerry or perhaps Obama um, will make a statement about the basis for the continuation of the negotiations. The Israeli and Palestinian leaders will be expected to either accept um, uh, such a statement or to uh, express reservations about it, but nevertheless agree to continue negotiations. I think the red line for the Americans is that neither party explicitly um, uh, reject it. Now, the big question here, of course, is, is will the Palestinians, and specifically um, Mahmoud Abbas, um, agree to go along with this. Many people have suggested if you look at the list of American demands from recognition of Israel as a Jewish state to basically establishing the wall as the western boundary of a Palestinian entity and so on, that this is simply not something um, Mahmoud Abbas can agree to. My sense is that he can and that he will agree to it, certainly as the basis for renewed uh, negotiations, um, and particularly if he's also given the opportunity to express a number of reservations. Now, the reason that, that he would go along with this is several. Um, first of all, this is a leadership with no alternative to negotiations. And given that they also lack the capacity to produce an alternative framework for, for negotiations, um, this will push them, I think, strongly in, into the um, uh, into the uh, into accepting Kerry's proposal for renewed uh, negotiations. Um, second of all, if one looks at the state of fragmentation and division within the Palestinian political system, um, the ability of Palestinian political movements or popular movements or others to exercise real and certainly decisive influence on Palestinian decision making is for all intents and purposes at this point in time non-existent. Um, uh, if, for example, Palestinians in Jordan take to the streets en masse uh, 
um, to protest uh, the continuation of negotiations, that will have, in my view, no significant or meaningful impact on, on Palestinian decision makers. The same could be argued for, for example, Palestinians in Gaza. Thirdly, ha uh, Hamas, um, uh, the main rival to the leadership in Ramallah, is not in principle opposed to the continuation of negotiations. What Hamas leaders have been saying is that um, uh, they don't really mind um, talks continuing uh, indefinitely because they don't believe that this framework is serious. They don't think it's going to go anywhere. And what they're really worried about is an agreement. And as long as it's just you know more negotiations like we've had for the past 20 years, it's, it's something that they're prepared to live with um, in the context of, of new agreements between um, Hamas and the leadership of, uh, of Mahmoud Abbas. Now, so I think the preponderance of, of factors argues for a Palestinian acquiescence, not only in, in, the, um, in the continuation of negotiations, but also towards the broad outlines of a permanent settlement, which I would see as a um, Palestinian entity um, east of the wall, basically liquidation of the refugee question, some Palestinian presence in, in East Jerusalem, and an entity that basically has neither sovereignty um, nor independence um, uh, in any meaningful sense of the term. Um, uh, and this raises a question, I think, is the issue uh, one state or two states, um, uh, or is the more meaningful issue what kind of two-state settlement are we talking about? Are we talking about a genuine two-state solution, as I suspect most of us understand that term on the basis of UN Security Council 242 and 338? Or rather, are we heading towards a quote-unquote two-state settlement where what where the outcome is is going to be a, a an entity um, based in, in in the West Bank, uh, which really doesn't enjoy any any significant level of, of independence or sovereign or sovereignty. Um, now this is this would be my my informed view of where things are heading, um, but nevertheless there is also the possibility that in several weeks. Um, Abbas will feel he has to um, uh, reject um, uh, a continuation of negotiations. This, in my view, is an unlikely and will be an extremely significant development because it would open up the Palestinian leadership to all kinds of pressures. And bear in mind, as I was suggesting, the main pressures that this leadership is susceptible to are external <coughs> rather than ex internal in terms of its funding sources, its, its international alliances, its, its continued reliance on, on Israeli um, uh, goodwill for basic functions and so on. Nevertheless, there is an internal joker in the pack. That joker in the pack goes by the name of Mohammed Dahran, um, uh, the uh, key Fatah leader who has basically been expelled uh, from the movement several years ago, has been living in exile as a national security uh, advisor um, to the leadership in, in Abu Dhabi, and more recently has been residing in Cairo um, as a, I, perhaps I, I think it's a national security advisor now to um, uh, Egypt's uh, democratically um, installed uh, <laughs> leadership. Um, and, and what's interesting here is now you actually have a Palestinian um, uh, political schism, which consists of three rather than two poles. It's no longer Fatah versus Hamas. It's Fatah, Hamas, and Mohammed Dahlan. Um, and and just to digress very briefly, and I realize I should try to finish it within, within the next few minutes. But at, at the time of the Fatah Hamas split, um, quite a few analysts and observers said that you know if you look at the the dynamics that have been in place since Oslo, a split between the West Bank and Gaza was more or less um, inevitable. And had Hamas not participated in the 2006 elections, and had the, subsequently the Fatah-Hamas split not occurred, we would have seen a different schism 
between Fatah and the West Bank and Fatah and the Gaza Strip. We now have a situation where we effectively have both. We have, on the one hand, the schism between um, uh, Fatah and Hamas, and also within Fatah, which is also increasingly acquiring a geographic um, uh, dimension in terms of of Dahlan and and Abbas. Now, um, uh, Hamas, despite its very um, intense hostility to Dahlan over the years, and he's kind of you know the ultimate bogeyman in Islamist circles, nevertheless has a real interest in reconciling with him rather than with Abbas because he provides uh, Hamas with an opportunity to normalize relations with Egypt at a time when the growing Egyptian pressure on on the Gaza Strip um, has has caused Hamas to experience um, unprecedented hardship in terms of maintaining its rule in the Gaza Strip. Dahlan, despite his hostility to um, uh, Hamas and effectively being seconded to Cairo to undermine um, uh, Hamas, has also an interest in normalizing relations with Hamas because this could strengthen his position in terms of making a comeback um, uh, within uh, Fatah. And Abu Mazen, for his part, now has an increased interest in reconciliation with Hamas precisely in order to once again marginalize Muhammad Dahlan. And it's quite interesting when you look at um, you know, when, when Sisi first overthrew um, uh, uh, Morsi back in July, there was practically dancing in the streets of Ramallah. Um, they're looking at it quite differently now because um, while it has weakened uh, Hamas, much more importantly is that it appears to have strengthened, um, uh, strengthened uh, Dahlan. So I'll, I'll just, I th- looking at the clock, very briefly conclude um, that my sense is that um, the Kerry plan is serious, um, that it's that the continuation of negotiations at this point appear to me virtually certain, um, that the purpose of, of continuing negotiations are to achieve a definitive Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement rather than simply to spin wheels and, and prevent the emergence of a vacuum, um, that the substance of this agreement um, uh, for for those who have not shared um, uh, the, the, the positive views of Oslo, if I can put it that way, that, that this this is an agreement that will be substantially more detrimental to Palestinian interests than was Oslo. Um, and I would just make two quick observations by way of conclusion: is that first of all, in terms of um, Abbas's um, mandate having expired and so on, well. History is littered with examples of illegitimate leaders <laughs> who make legitimate agreements. And so the idea that you know, he somehow hasn't been democratically elected or whatever will have no consequence, I think, on the international reception and international legitimacy of such an agreement. Second of all, um, we need to bear in mind that this agreement can have very serious long-term <laughs> consequences because international law is a dynamic rather than static phenomenon. I mean, to give one example, as, as you know, in 1947, the United Nations General Assembly passed a partition resolution allotting something between a quarter and a third of the current Israeli state to an Arab state. Um, yet, in 1967, on the basis of UN Security Council Resolution 242, any prior claim that, that these previous territories were occupied territories simply disappeared. It's, it's under, let's say, current norms, it would be virtually impossible um, to make the argument that in the context of a two-state settlement, Israel needs to um, withdraw not only to the 1967 boundaries, but also from territory that was allotted to an Arab state in, in, in 1947. Similarly, if Israelis and, and if Israeli and Palestinian leaders reach an agreement recognizing the West Bank wall as a legitimate international border between them, well, how can you then mobilize, for example, the 2004 ICJ resolution declaring the illegality of this wall where it lies within the West Bank? How can you mobilize that to 
um, uh, to challenge Israeli occupation <coughs> of Palestinian territory. And therefore, um, uh, from my point of view, the, the, the Palestinian priority at this point um, uh, should be to um, reconstruct the Palestinian national movement on the basis of national and inclusive representation um, which is able to formulate a coherent and dynamic uh, strategy with a credible unified leadership that mobilizes all available resources, first and foremost, the Palestinian people themselves. Um, it needs to focus not only on the kind of big picture issues that, we've been, that I've been discussing, but also on the small battles. And I think only through this combination can the core objective of arresting and reversing Israeli impunity and substituting that with Israeli accountability for its policies um, uh, be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much.